Good evening. Good evening. Good to be here. My name is On Olander, and um, you probably can guess it. I come from Sweden, uh, live right outside of Malmö, and um, I'm here for um, since uh, Monday to deliver uh, Squam classes in uh, collaboration with Procognita. And I was asked to uh, to talk tonight in front of you guys, and I'm happy to be here. I'm going to talk about this that you see here, Agile Lean Leadership. Agile Lean Leadership grows organizations. That's the first word, and you can, uh, you can um, read for yourself uh, the little tagline here. Um, we grow organization to generate sustainable value uh, for all stakeholders. And stakeholders, of course, customers, users, those within the company. And we want to build resilient, fast, reliable, and innovative organizations. Don't we all? Good. So I'm not totally <laughs> offline then. So, um, Hopefully this will be useful for you. Uh, I will uh, end with uh, a, a link to where you can find more information. And uh, we will hopefully also be able to uh, put this um, on YouTube. So um, anyone who have met any or observed any good leadership lately? So no. a couple of hands, uh, not, not all of you. So probably we are in need of better leadership. Um, one guy who um, is a good leader, his name is David Marquette. And uh, he was a captain in the American Navy for uh, submarines. And he was trained for a year to uh, become captain of a new nuclear submarine. And then right before he was supposed to enter the ship, he was uh, transferred to another ship, to uh, this one, the USS Santa Fe. And uh, the interesting thing is that it was completely different. But he was trained for another type of ship, another submarine. But uh, he is an American, he is a captain, and what do they do? They just carry on. So he carried on. And uh, they prepared for their first trip. And he uh, told uh, the person who were moving the, the throttle to do two thirds ahead. And uh, nothing happened. And after a while he said, two thirds ahead. Nothing happened. Um, after a while he started to get a little frustrated. So he talked to the guy next to him. So I said, two thirds ahead. Well, sir, there is no two thirds ahead on this ship. Hmm. And you knew it, uh, Marquette said. Yes, I did. So why didn't, you, uh, why didn't you say anything? Well, sir, you gave an order. And then it downed him, uh, downed upon him that this ship, those people in the Navy, they were trained for compliance. Uh, they were trained to separate the thinking and the doing. So the, they, um, they uh, kind of uh, relied upon uh, the captain to, uh, to think. And here is uh, Marquette. Um, so, what should we think about? Should we have leaders and followers, or leaders and leaders? That is a question that me, uh, Kurt Nielsen, and Geir Amfre, all uh, three Scandinavian uh, certified scrum trainers, have been thinking about. And um, we, uh, we don't want it to be like this. Uh, this is the, um, the handbook from the US Navy. And um, what um, it says is, leadership can be defined as directing the thoughts, plans, and actions of others so as to obtain and command their obedience, their confidence, their respect, and their loyal cooperation. And that may work in some situations. Probably it works if you have a very simple environment a very simple domain. Uh, it may very well work in a complicated domain as well. But in today's world, where we have complex environments, complex domains, it will not work. We are pretty sure about that. So we are trying to find something else. We're trying to avoid stuff like Prince 2, where you plan, delegate, monitor, and control. Rather, 
we want this to be up to self-organized teams that give are given a, an assignment uh, about what, but they give the, get the opportunity to think about how to de do it. So we want to show the following. The outcome of complex work can be improved, uh, and there are a couple of things that you need to do in order to be successful. Uh, we believe that value creation can uh, be increased. Um, we believe that we can keep on finding new good solutions, and we can take leaps. Um, a organization, adaptability, resilience, and other things can be improved. Uh, sustainability and we certainly believe that uh, the satisfaction of customers, employees, stakeholders can grow as well. Um, and we believe that we need the following. We need a connection to a robust integration of vision, strategy and tactics and that's not enough. We need to engage people as well. So in the US Navy, they had a pretty robust integration of vision, strategy, and tactics. But they didn't allow individuals to engage fully with this part of their body. Um, that part and that part, but maybe not what's behind their foreheads. Um, so some words from an old Chinese guy, Sun Tzu. Um, Strategy and tactics, uh, it's hard to, um, to um, separate them. You need to, uh, to have both, otherwise it's hard. Um, so, what are the challenges for organizations today? I'm sure you have uh, a long list of challenges in your daily work. I have, for sure. Um, and uh, so, for example, we, uh, we like to plan. This is how we believe it should be. I'm sure some of you have seen this illustration. Um, but reality may very well look like this. So how do we deal with this? How can we actually look further ahead? And how far ahead can we actually look? We don't really know that. So um, today the challenge is, is that we have changes at an ever accelerating pace. Um, so we need to deal with that. Uh, technology, of course. Um, globalization will s put stress on us. Um, what else? Uh, companies buying other companies, consolidation. Um, I just uh, learned that uh, there is some sort of consolidation going on in the bank here, for example. So that's a good example. Um, and what we see today in organizations is that the amount of knowledge work required to be really good is much bigger than what we had just five, ten years ago. So all of these changes, they put demands on us employees. Um, and what kind of demands? Well, we need to be able to change and learn, not only once, but twice and three times and many times and all the times. So that's something to remember. We need to learn and we need to change all the time. Uh, we need to be able to work in teams. Uh, because there is not one single person who can solve all the problems and very few of us can solve problems on our own. Part of them, yes, but we need to learn to work in teams and also sometimes re-team for transient teams to deal with certain specific situa situations. Um, Fortunately or unfortunately, depending on how you look upon it, it's probably not enough to have one speciality. I'm sure a couple of you have heard about competence profiles and uh, how people, um, many times they talk about, we really need T-shaped people. Have you heard that? So, T-shaped. The last thing I heard was that we need pie-shaped people. And it wasn't apple pie they were thinking about. It was the mathematical symbol pie, where you have a primary knowledge and competence and a secondary competence uh, to go with that. So that's something that we may need to be prepared for. Um, 
all of these changes, they also put higher demand on leadership. Um, command and control, that was the Navy way. Um, that's not going to make it for very long. So um, in today's world, it's much harder to plan ahead. Um, and um, what else? Well, we also need to be able to deal with leadership in a complex situation. Uh, if we have a simple environment, uh, we know that we can plan and we can enforce the plan and we get what is expected. Um, I have a very silly example of that. So if I were to give you all an instruction on a piece of paper on how to use the papers you have in front of yourself to fold a paper airplane, and you were all good to, uh, to follow the instructions, then we would get pretty good airplanes flying all across the, the room. Uh, that's a, a simple environment, a simple domain, where you can plan ahead and you can follow the plans and then you get what you want. But in a complex domain, that's not possible. So um, what are complex domains? Well, um, if we look east of here, there is a big country. And uh, in a couple of days, I think in 10 days, there's going to be a complex tournament in, um, in Russia, the World Championships in football. And football is a complex game. Uh, you cannot plan exactly. The, the, the manager of, of the Swedish team, of course, he tells his players how to run and so on. But he doesn't have detailed plans on exactly what steps they should take and exactly where the goalkeeper should stand. They need to use their experience, they need to use their intuition, and they need to replan constantly. So that's a, a complex environment. Um, and knowledge workers. Um, as a leader in a complex domain, you need to be able to lead knowledge workers. So you need to know something about things like um, motivation. What kind of motivations do we have? We have uh, extrinsic motivation and intrinsic motivation. Extrinsic motivation is usually called either uh, whip or carrot. They may work to some extent, but probably not all the way. So we need to know something about intrinsic motivation. Um, so the demands from us as employee on the workplace, socially. Um, we want to see why are we building this product? What is the purpose of doing what we do? Um, anyone who likes that? Yeah, I like that. And I see a couple of hands uh, more than mine. Um, what about this? Having some degree of autonomy uh, on your own work. More hands. Uh, and what about this? Who wants to grow and mature your skills? These are examples of intrinsic motivations. And, uh, um, there is um, a professor in Oslo, Anders Duisvik. He's been um, uh, doing a lot of research in this area. And he says that many people in the knowledge work area, they, they have the intrinsic motivators of purpose, autonomy, and mastery. And um, you may have heard about a guy named Daniel Pink, who wrote a book called Drive. He's referring to the research by Anders Duisvik. So you, you, you re recognize those. And this is important to remember as well. So as uh, Winston Churchill said, it's always wise to look ahead, but it's difficult to look further than you can see. So how far into the future can we see? How far can we plan? And how can we prepare for those things that we cannot plan for today, but we know that tomorrow or next week or next month, we need to plan for that? How can we pre be prepared for that? So I'm not going to bore you by going through all of these old men and uh, the one woman, I think, uh, old men and one woman. Uh, I'm going to tell you about the, the basics here. We have a timeline going from 1900 to 2000. And uh, we have um, 
above the line and underneath the line. Above the line, it says power, plan, and numbers. This is the way to run management for in many situations. And it uh, comes from this guy up here uh, to the left, uh, Frederick Winslow Taylor. I'm sure you've heard about Taylorism. Um, and he had some followers. You see the names of those people. And then you see Neo-Taylorism. Um, and there you see people like Robert McNamara uh, in the US uh, government during the Vietnam War. Uh, Donald Rumsfeld, I'm sure you've heard what he knows about things known unknowns and unknown unknowns and stuff like that. And uh, this guy, Bjarn Corridon, he is the, the father of new public management, which uh, has been a trend in many countries, uh, not always successful. Uh, so that's one way of looking at management and leadership, very much power, plan, and numbers. And then below the line, it says uh, value, people and innovation. And here the central uh, person is uh, W. Edwards Deming, um, the quality guru uh, with his 14 principles. And uh, also Tachi Ono from uh, Japan and Toyota. And uh, followers lately, Tom Gilb, Ken Schwaber, Jeff Sutherland, Dave Snowden, and uh, Amy Edmondson. So what do you think, what sounds best? Power, plan, and numbers, or value, people, and innovation? If you can choose, what, should you, what would you choose to kind of lead your organization? Depends on the situation. It depends on the situation. Of course it does. So in a, in a simple situation, in a complicated situation, power plan and numbers may work. In complex situations, then you probably need to rely more on value, people, and innovation. So this is why I show this. Uh, um, here you have Taylor. Here you have Deming's, Deming. And, uh, Let's talk a little about complexity. One of the guys um, to the right, uh, bottom part, was Dave Snowden. I don't think he's related to another Snowden that you may have uh, read about in the news. Uh, Dave Snowden, he has been studying complexity. And he's created a model called the Kunevin model. And the Kunevin model describes, uh, not simple, but he calls it obvious today. An obvious situation. What is the best uh, decision to make? Well, it's obvious. We should do this. So here we talk about sense, categorize, and respond. This is the domain of uh, best practices. And then he talks about complicated, where we need to analyze or we need to ask uh, an expert what is the best decision to make. So uh, we depend on sense, analyze, and respond. And this is the domain of good practices. Um, he also, well now I um, apologize for the bad color here, hopefully you can read, complex. Here we talk about probe, sense, and respond. So probe is making a, an experiment. Um, in a complex domain, we know what we want, but we don't necessarily know exactly what steps to get. So we, we take one step in, in the direction of where we want, and then we inspect and possibly adapt. Um, so probe is the experiment. Then we inspect, we respond, we sense, we respond. And this is the domain of emerging practices. We may find out new things that we didn't know about before, that practices that actually work, because those experiments helps us to, uh, to uh, learn that. And then chaos. Here, if we have chaos, it's more or less act, run for your life, then sense and respond. Uh, here we have novel practices. Uh, I'm not sure if you uh, have seen this YouTube video that go, went viral from France the other uh, week. The guy climbing a building and saving a small kid. Yes. Did you see that? Yeah. So what did he do? Did he, uh, did he analyze? 
Did he uh, make experiments? He just acted. That was a chaotic situation. And he also showed some novel um, practice. Um, in the Kunevin model, there is something called disorder, which he puts in the middle. And there is something which he calls the zone of complacency. Uh, and the interesting part of that is that if you are in an obvious domain, and um, all of a sudden you risk entering um, an abyss down to the down to the chaotic part, and if you get there, you cannot not go directly to uh, obvious. You have to kind of deal with chaos, complex, complicated until you get back to to obvious, and that may be a problem. So, zone of complacency is a dangerous zone. Uh, we need to be on our toes. That's what uh, people in sports say. You shouldn't be on your heels. You should be on your toes. I have a hard time being on both, but that's my problem. Um, so, Kunevin, developed by Dave Snowden. Um, and why am I talking about this? Well, because much to work today is in the complex domain. Um, so, based on this model, um, I'm going to ask you how many of you believe that you are in the obvious, complicated, complex, and chaos um, when you are working. So, let's see how it looks here. So, how many in an obvious environment? I cannot see one hand. How many in a complicated environment? I see a couple, maybe ten. How many in a complex domain? Now uh, I lost count, so maybe 30, something like that. And chaos, yeah, a few in chaos. Um, so you just have to act and then uh, respond. Uh, you may need to uh, invent novel practices. Uh, the thing in a complex domain is that it's really, really hard to see combination of cause and effect until afterwards. So even if we know it afterwards, we don't know that it will work next time. It worked this time, but it's complex, so it may not work next time either. So um, we need to constantly experiment, inspect, and adapt. We have to learn while doing stuff. Um, so be careful for those uh, using those big upfront detailed plans if you believe you are in a complex domain. Of course you can have ideas and you can have a goal because if we have a goal we can also take a step towards that goal and we can inspect and adapt. Okay, I want to go and meet that guy in the back but here are a couple of people in my way so maybe I need to take a detour. And if we have a mingle party then it's even harder because then all of you would be moving around all the time, even more complex. Uh, sometimes we need to work in parallel um, to build up knowledge. And what about traditional project management? Well, it can be used in the areas of obvious and complicated. Um, Scrum, Agile, and Lean are better suited to deal with the border uh, between uh, it's off, often here, um, complex, complicated, on that border. So um, here is Dave Snowden once again. Here is traditional management where you can use that and make some sense of it. And here is where you, uh, you probably uh, are operating if you are uh, working according to Scrum, Agile, or Lean. Uh, at least that's where you get most of the leverage uh, you may use those ways of working to, uh, to uh, manage and control even in, a, in, a, in an obvious domain, but you may not get as much leverage. The difference may not be as big. Um, so um, anyone heard about this guy, Douglas MacGregor? Um, it's a nice, um, nice uh, year there, 1960. That was the year when the world saw me, so um, I like that. He is the guy behind Theory X and Theory Y. Uh, have you heard about that? Mm -hmm. A couple of nods. Um, so th 
It's about attitude, direction, responsibility, motivation, and creativity. And I won't uh, bore you by talking. I'll uh, let you um, read for yourself. And you see um, how the theory is. And just the first two. People dislike work, find it boring, and will avoid it if they can. That's what the people who believe in theory X are thinking. So they make their assumptions based upon that belief. And people believing in theory Y, people need to work and they want to take an interest in it. Under right conditions, they can enjoy it. Um, so if I ask you personally, are you on the theory X side or the theory Y side? So how many theory X? Not many. How many theory Y? Much more. And now, next question. Those of you who said theory Y, what do you think about those people around you? Do you think they are theory Y or theory X? Or your fellow workers, do you think they are theory Y or theory X? What about your boss? Is the boss theory Y or theory X? X. 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 Um, this guy, uh, Nils uh, Flagging, he said this. Everyone immediately knows I'm a theory Y sort of person. And when asked about other people, however, the answer is usually not as clear cut. Theory X is nothing more than the prejudice that we have about other people. That may be true or may not be true, but it's good to talk about these things. So having prejudices, we all have them to some degree or not. But checking our assumptions, uh, challenging our prejudices may be good. So maybe you should talk to the Theory X boss. I don't know. Talk to the boss and see what happens. Um, so uh, Matthew Stewart, he added another dimension. He talked about utopian and tragic as well. And um, here is those uh, dimension, theory X, theory Y. And um, um, Stewart, he said that there is a utopian and there is a tragic. I don't know why he calls it tragic. The utopian theory X is what we call the programmers, the tailorists, and the utopian uh, theory Y is freedom lovers. Some call them uh, hippies. Uh, and they are sometimes questioned. And then uh, what we have to the upper left, uh, controllers. Um, they are not very good. And what we are looking for may be those up here called constitutionalists, like uh, uh, John Madison, uh, one of the founding fathers. And the conflict here is usually between the controllers and the, the flower power guys. Um, and this may be the best situation to be. Um, we believe that we need theory Y. But we also believe that we need some constraints for checks and balances. Uh, leaving everything free flowing may not be the best idea. So um, intrinsic motivation I talked about before. I'm just going to mention it very quickly again. Um, so um, here you have those purpose, autonomy, masteries, mastery. And here is Anders Duisvik. Um, his research is pretty, uh, pretty heavy. Data from over uh, 11,000 uh, respondents from more than 100 organizations. Sorry, uh, maybe I was a little fast. Um, we think this is important. and. Uh, we also think that um, enabling constraints are important because if we allow everything in a complex domain, we may not be able to gather any power in any direction. So in, in Scrum, for example, um, you are in a complex domain. You, know, you don't know where this bubble of air or this, um, this cloud ends uh, or when it begins. So we may need some uh, constraints like um, iteration 
definitions like uh, quality, definition of done. Uh, we may need some uh, other constraints like uh, roles, teams. We may need uh, constraints like events, activities, ceremonies, meetings, you call it what you want. And definitely we may need some constraints when it comes to artifacts that we should use. So uh, by, um, by using those constraints we can kind of contain uh, the complex domain a little better. Uh, artifacts are for visualization. So then we have kind of made the playing field a little smaller, maybe a little easier to deal with, and hopefully we become more successful. Enabling constraints. Um, so what we want to do is to build an organization, and I'm just going to check timing so I'm not babbling on forever and not too short either. So here is what we want. We want a fast organization that can respond to uh, necessary things to respond upon. Uh, we want an organization that has a consistency in purpose so that we can rely on that. Uh, we want it to be reliable and resilient. So keep promises and commitments. Um, in Sweden, um, there was uh, last year a big scandal in the government. And that scandal was about um, some outsourcing of IT services to countries outside of Sweden. And it turned out that they outsourced dealing with uh, with uh, sensitive information on people to other countries, to people with, who did not have a security clearance. And um, today, uh, the, the part of the Swedish parliament that was reviewing all of this, they uh, gave some really uh, bad reviews of the different secretaries uh, that were involved. And even the prime minister got like a warning or what you call it. Uh, and I was thinking that maybe they would benefit from these ways of dealing with things. They should be able to respond to things because they were really following the rules but no one told the Prime Minister. And at the end of the day, it's the Prime Minister's uh, responsibility that the government works. And it's the Prime Minister's responsibility that the other people in the government actually tells him about what is ongoing um, so that he can uh, deal with it. I'm, sure, I'm not sure he can deal with outsourcing. But anyway, innovative and then the balance, focus, on and creates value for customer, employees, and other stakeholders. And not to forget society at large, and not at least government. Um, so a couple of details about this. And um, then how do we want to organize? Well, this is the fundamental uh, uh, thing, uh, the fundamental concept when uh, scaling out. Because what we see today is that it's not enough with one person. It's not enough with one team. Many teams need to be there. And we believe that you should organize yourself in circles. So this to some may uh, be uh, familiar and look something like uh, Scrum with a product owner, with a Scrum master and a development team. And yes, it does. Uh, but it also looks a little like the submarine we saw before with a commanding officer and an executive officer. So CO stands for commanding officer, XO stands for uh, executive officer, uh, and team stands for the people who uh, perform the work. Uh, and we have a couple of artifacts here. We have something called a circle manifest, and the circle manifest um, tells us who are we, what is the purpose, what do we do, and how to interact with us. Uh, that's internal for the circle, but we want to show it to others as well. We have the main backlog. If you know anything about Scrum, it's like the product backlog. That's the commanding officer dealing with that. You have a 
tactical backlog. If you know Scrum, that's like the sprint backlog. And we have other things like improvement backlog, collection of good ideas to become even better than we are right now. So this is the fundamental concept when you scale out in an organization. But you also have the roles, of course, commanding officer, executive officer, and team. And the team should be cross-functional and self-organized. Um, you recognize a lot of this from Agile and Scrum. Um, we know some of that. And then you want to map circles and relations. And when you map, you want to start somewhere. And you want to start with customers. So who should we serve? We call them customers here, and we can talk about customer circles. And uh, maybe they are built up similar, but maybe not exactly the same. But you can have individuals as customers as well, of course. Then you have a periphery of circles in your organization meeting the customers, being interfacing the customers. This could be sales department. This could be <laughs> marketing department. This could be uh, product management. This could be uh, support, uh, global support, whatever you call it, and so on and so on. Customer support. And then you have relationships. What you have here in between also is what we call a relation manifest. That tells us a little about how, what they can, um, what they can um, ask us about, what they can expect us to do. Um, then in the organization, we probably need some center circles as well. And they have relations with the periphery circles. And they have a relation manifest with them as well. And then we have a level two. We call it tactical resolution. We call it strategic resolution. And we call it operational resolution. So tactical resolution, that's, you see the color, yellow. And in the, in the teams here, you have yellow as well. So this this is about synchronization between different uh, teams on a tactical level. And then the blue one, that's the commanding officers, uh, priorities, strategic decisions. Uh, if things are not going as we want, if new things happen, we need to be able to respond to that on a strategic level as well. Um, and then the operational uh, resolution. That's the executive uh, officers, the, the scrum masters, or the likes of them. Uh, making sure that we are not f all fixing the same problem. Actually gathering forces to fix the big problems in the organization. We may have suppliers also, so then it may be uh, good to talk about the supplier role and a uh, relation manifest towards them. Um, so very quickly, um, identify, understand who are your customer, who should we serve, create circles to maximize the value stream. Uh, because we want to make it good for the customers. And then uh, describe the relations. Uh, repeat this exercise with a circle in the center. Repeat it with the circles uh, for um, suppliers. Uh, define the initial need for uh, collaboration and synchronization and uh, resolution of dependencies. That's a tactical thing. Uh, the same how we operate and respond times, etc. And one of the companies uh, that we have been working with, they had a management group that promised every team in the organization that they would resolve any issue within 24 hours. And that's pretty tough, uh, tough uh, promise. Um, so if they want to build trust, they need to meet that uh, promise. Otherwise, it's not going to be very good. Um, what we may have also are secondary circles towards the bottom. Like you hear sometimes about guilds, uh, communities of practice. That's the kind of things we are thinking about here when we talk about the secondary circles. So um, what we want here is high internal coherence. 
We want low external coupling and also we um, want to define principles of prioritization in circles. So for example, this um, circle here. Uh, when this circle get requests from circle A and when they get requests from circle B, what should they do? Uh, well, one way of resolving this, uh, this um, conflict is to flip a coin. Uh, of course, not very many decide to do that resolution. They have other, better ways of defining the, how to resolve that. Maybe they say that uh, circle A always have priority before circle B for some, some reason, or we need to ask someone before we can resolve it and so on. And escalation principles. When do we need to escalate? And how can we do to reduce delivering delivery distances. Because if we have too long between the customer and those creating the work, even suppliers, that's not really good. So how can we, how can we reduce delivery distances? Um, you may also want to do some sort of business roadmap, sketching uh, what we are looking for a couple of quarters ahead. Market map, features and benefits, technical architecture, you name it, for our product or products. Um, and um, this can be useful. Um, There are companies, here are a couple of examples, who are able to, um, to work in uh, similar ways, uh, quite successful. And uh, also what we saw in the, the latest, uh, latest issue of Harvard Business Review is about agile at scale, how to create a truly flexible organization. And uh, that's uh, not what we are talking about here, Agile at scale, but it's very similar. So uh, we felt confident that our thoughts are in the right area. And uh, what we need to remember though is all of this does not happen spontaneously. We need to make some in we have some intention and make some judged decisions on what to do. So things doesn't fall by themselves. This neo-Taylorist separation of thinking and doing, we need to replace it by decentralized uh, responsibility and so on. Uh, push the mandate as far out as possible in the organization to us who are doing the actual work. That's usually good. And try to get rid of top-down bureaucracy, micromanagement, but we need to replace it by something. So a network of self-organized teams is our answer. And they should have clear mandates um, because we know that under micromanagement, people only contribute very, very minimally. When you let us free, we can do wonders. Um, the control of information and decision making, we need to have the courage to let go of that. And we need to replace it by, with something. Uh, what we call uh, it is radical transparency. All the artifacts should help us to be transparent. Then, of course, there is always a decision. Should it be transparent to only part of the world or to the entire world? If we are in a business, probably we want to keep the transparency within certain limits. Uh, but. How can I react fast without transparency? That's really, really hard. So that's a precondition to, to um, react fast. So where is the information? There we should have the decision power. And it's really, really good to understand how complex work, the nature of that. So experiments, work in an iterative way, are a couple of clues to uh, be successful. And we need some common cause. That's what really binds us together. Uh, and goals. Uh, we don't necessarily need rules and regulations. Um, if I tell you to what you should look for. You may miss the really good opportunities because you're looking for certain other things. Um, 
I'm not going to show that video, but you can, um, you can, um, uh, yeah, I'll see if I can um, give a, a link to an interesting video where, where you're asked to observe a certain thing and then afterwards you notice that there were things going on in the video that you didn't observe because you were looking at some aspects. Uh, I think some of you know what I'm thinking of. Um, okay, Kunevin. Um, here is a very, very quick and uh, not very detailed roadmap that we uh, think is good to follow, that you can follow. Uh, so start with clear purpose, uh, base it on the organization's value, and organize primarily after delivery and value creation. Um, complex work, organize it in small self-organized teams. Uh, you may create hierarchy, but do it in form of circles at a higher level. Use secondary circles, um, transparent model for interaction of circles in the organization. Those are the different uh, relationship manifests. And feedback loops with rapid response time. Uh, then what you need to do, and this is where I started thinking about the Swedish Prime Minister. You need to handle exceptions and crisis decisively. You need to have rules how to deal with that. If something happens, we do what we can do and then we give up at some point and we, um, we escalate it. Um, so that should be in our spine. Um, here is the value proposition. Uh, we say that agile lean leadership, it guides organizations to become resilient and create sustainable value for all stakeholders. And we do this through times of change by being fast, reliable and innovative with a consistency of purpose. So we return to purpose. And we want individuals to engage. We want uh, to f them to feel uh, fulfillment and a sense of contribution. And also, we want a leadership structure that can support this. And we want organizations that can execute on its purpose. Uh, there is more than this, but I'll be very brief. I'll just mention that we have four values and 14 uh, principles um, about understanding and application. So four values, 16 principles. <laughs> Number one of the values, aim, clear and worthwhile. That's about purpose. Uh, two, sustainability in all things. Um, Three, resilience in all things to build a robust organization. And four, the last of the values, respect for people, individuals, our contributions and our possibility to contribute as well. Uh, because organizations today need to serve not only customers and stakeholders, but also employees. Um, I'm sure you've heard about uh, uh, Richard Branson or Sir Richard Branson. Do you know what he says? Treat your employees very well, then they will treat your customers well. I believe that's true. Um, principles. They are divided in different ways. I'm not going to talk very much about them. Values, vision and purpose, transparency and visibility, institutionalized learning, build and develop people and relations. Um, this is the front side of a book we're writing. It's a beta version zero. Point nine one. It's called Navigating the Rapids. Um, if you're interested in uh, receiving uh, a link to the PDF of this book, and if you're interested to contributing to our thoughts, uh, reviewing them, um, I'll uh, leave my um, email address and I'll leave the the link to um, uh, Agile Lean Leadership here. And uh, by that, I will. Be quiet and I will talk if you want me to. So thank you very much. So any questions or comments? My question is that 
uh, I, I need some kind of introduction. So this is kind of new methodology, how to improve uh, agile leadership. And uh, it was created by you and your colleagues. Uh, yeah, that's, that's true. So your question is about uh, if, um, what, what is all of this? Is it a new methodology? Who created it? What is it about? Well, it, it's, the, it's the kind of um, result of our combined thoughts about leadership that we have had for a long time. Uh, Kurt Nielsen from Denmark, Geir Amfö from Norway, and myself from Sweden. Scandinavian, we, we like that sometimes. Sometimes we keep to our own country. Um, so we have experience from a lot of different companies over a long time and what we have in common is that we are certified scrum trainers and coaches in scrum and agile and based upon that we started discussing and thinking and uh, uh, the guy who's done most of the thinking that's Kurt Nielsen so she ha he should have most of the uh, most of the appreciation if you like it if you don't like it blame me uh, so there are uh, organizations using this. Uh, it's fairly new, um, and uh, we are in the in the first steps of talking about it. Kurt and Ger have done some talking in uh, Norway and uh, Denmark, and I, me, and Kurt will do more talking in Sweden in the fall. So um, the first steps are taken, but we have customers who have been using it, and. Um, I need to check with Kurt if I can reveal the name of that. So I will not do that without his uh, consent. So, um, but um, I, we may be able to talk more about it. We we have the website. You can find more information if it's public. The information is there, definitely. You're welcome. Please. Um, you, you do have some experience with Polish companies, so uh, what is, in your opinion, the biggest challenge for, for our culture? Yeah. So, do I have experience of yeah. Polish companies? Yeah, um, I, I um, have been in Poland uh, not very many times. It's more than five and less than ten. Uh, what I've been doing in Poland is uh, delivering training classes in Scrum and Management 3.0. Uh, I've never worked with companies in Poland. I've talked to my uh, business partner here, Tomek Wykowski of Procognita, uh, and I've talked to other people uh, that I meet uh, during the classes, uh, but I'm probably not the best to answer your question. I'm sorry for that. Yes. So this is based on the experience, so could you give like one or two examples of the problems that you saw in Agile and Scrum when you were performing that led you to the developing this new methodology and how it solves them in the system? So to give some examples of uh, um, observations from Agile and Scrum that led us to these thoughts. So what we see a lot of time are times are uh, organizations where there is like a, a pocket of Agile or a pocket of Scrum um, and it spreads. It's sometimes contagious and sometimes it's like it, it can spread horizontally but not vertically. So that is one problem we've seen, that the, the, the entire company has not been uh, uh, contaminated, if we call it that, or uh, interested, if we are more, uh, more, um, more um, nice, w using more nice words. So that is one problem that we have observed. Uh, and that's also why we try to uh, emphasize that it's about the entire organization, and it's about um, organizing in circles all over the place, not only in teams doing product development, but also in the other parts of the organization. What we have also seen is uh, what I call friction between teams working according to Agile and Scrum and other parts of the organization. So there we have seen the need for some sort of resolution or decisions on how to act upon different things. Uh, not always is it clear in all organizations that you should uh, support the development teams. Um, I was working for a Swedish uh, mobile operator a couple of years ago and um, 
uh, we made some presentation on a conference about that work. Uh, they had very many business projects ongoing in parallel. They had a tremendously complex uh, uh, infrastructure and they noticed that in many of their business projects there was one group of people responsible for one particular uh, component in the infrastructure. Those guys were really good guys but what they did was almost always the bottleneck in the in the projects. So uh, what they uh, discovered was that or they decided uh, let's teach these guys Scrum and let's see if we can have uh, some part of the organization change a little. So one of the problems they had was about allocation of these guys. One project here wanted you in a pre-study and another project wanted you in the testing phase and one wanted you in the execution phase and that was true for always all those guys in that group. So by changing a couple of things, telling the business projects, you're not allowed to allocate people, you're just allowed to give them requirements. Putting a guy in uh, responsible of uh, prioritizing those requirements, he, he would be the product owner of that team. And um, in the beginning, very heavily weight on deadlines, of course, because uh, we wanted to keep deadlines. What happened was that the team members, they felt very good about this because they didn't have to go to all of the project meetings. They could focus on working. Management felt good about it because they um, didn't get as much escalation issues from this team. Um, and. Um, the only people who didn't like it that much was the project managers of the business projects because they had to change a little. What we also noticed was that this team, they learned pretty fast that in Scrum you should shield the team so that they can focus on what they have committed to. So everyone else who asked them for help, they said, no way, we are working according to Scrum. We are shielded. But they also knew that a Scrum Master should help them get rid of impediments. So when they wanted help from other teams, they demanded that the Scrum Master got the other teams to help them. So it was kind of one way, but they learned eventually to, to do better. So those kind of things, the friction between the teams working with product development according to Scrum or Agile, and the rest of the organization. Make sure that those interfaces are really, really clear Circle manifest is our answer to that. You, you may like it or you may believe it's worth trying, but um, there may be other ways as well. So hopefully that's an answer to your question. Yes? So far, uh, my, my word was quite simple when we talk about Azure methods. Uh, I thought that everything begins with Scrum, then for scaling you have less or save or that. And for leadership, you have management 3.0 and beyond budgeting. But you and your colleagues thought that maybe something is missing in this uh, methodology uh, landscape, and you, you are proposing something new. So why do you think it's not enough to have this scaling methods and management 3.0? So what, what we see in uh, a lot of the things that you mentioned is um, that we have been influenced by them. I, I have one image that I didn't show today. That's a big map of all our influences. And uh, everything that you have mentioned, maybe not um, DAB, but all of the others have been influencing our thinking. Um, but still there was something missing and uh, um, what we see sometimes is that some of those setups like uh, Scrum at scale from Jeff Sutherland, he have things similar to the circles we are talking about. And there are a couple of other things that we think is lacking there. So we thought why not? Uh, let's see if uh, our thoughts are worth anything. Let's uh, be a little bold and courageous and bring it to Poland and see if we can get some criticism. <laughs> Sorry for the joke, please. <laughs> yeah, I wanted to ask you, from your experience, what is the bigger challenge to bring the change to the teams, to the employees, or rather the management? So, your question, what is the bigger challenge to bring change to teams or to management? I've seen both. 
Uh, and if you force me to answer, are you forcing me to answer? Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> um, so, um, management. But remember, the, the people who are managers um, and the people working within management, they are usually as smart as the other person, as smart as all of us. Uh, but um, there are different pressures. So what pressure do a manager have? And what pressure do a team member have? They are different. I would say a manager has a heavier pressure than uh, team members. And uh, when I uh, deliver my classes, uh, what we... Um, what we discuss sometimes is the risk for product owners. What is the risk if product owners put pressure on development teams? And then sometimes I get a question back. What is the risk of not doing that? That was a manager asking that. So, so pressure is different. Uh, therefore, I believe it's harder. It's, it's, I mean, it's harder to move under pressure. Can I have a continu continuation Please. of this question? Please. So how do you get rid of this resistance? Because they are kind of in a hard situation. Because you're forcing, to the, forcing them to do something that is super hard for them to do, right? So how do you, how do you do that? Yes, so continued question. How do you get rid of resistance? Um, sometimes it's resistance. Sometimes it's just like they are in a straitjacket. They cannot really move. But how do we get rid of the uh, resistance or the straight jacket? Um, my way of doing it is um, by communication and by asking questions. Ask my wife, ask my kids. They are dead tired of all my questions all the time. We had uh, relatives over for Christmas last year and my uh, wife's brother, he asked her at once, does Anna always answer questions by a new question? And my wife sh said yes. So I ask questions and I ask questions like, what is painful in your situation as a manager? What are the problems for the organization? And what about if we could find some sort of solution to your problems and some sort of pain reliever to your pains? Um, that usually gets some attention. Then I need to build trust, of course. Uh, so we, we need to do some s smaller experiments. Uh, we, um, there were two uh, slides that I went very quickly uh, through because I didn't want to do too much marketing here. I wanted to inform rather than market. But that's an educational program that we are offering for different level of the organization. And uh, it is a challenge to get managers to those kind of uh, uh, training classes, of course. Um, but many of them, if they have the possibility to stop a little, think a little, reflect a little, they are able to do tremendous thinking and uh, actions as well. So it's more the pressure on the straitjacket than any resistance, if you ask me. Thanks. Please. So as far as I understood, you use agile in leadership to transform the organization, right? But what is the basic difference with other frameworks for uh, organization transformation, like agility path framework, for example. Um, so, what is the major difference yeah. between what we are talking about and what did you? I didn't hear. Agility path. A agility, agility path. path. Um, I honestly don't know. Agility path is not my strength. Okay. Um, so I cannot answer that question. Uh, but now I have something I need to note in my uh, notebook, what I need to, to learn about. Sorry for that. Yes. So uh, I work in IT, and I have seen a lot of mastery, a lot of uh, autonomy, but not a lot of purpose. <laughs> and I would like you. Uh, I, maybe you've got some example of bringing purpose to software houses, for example, mm -hmm. when, uh, well, we can uh, make our client earning <laughs> more money, or how, uh, how to get purpose mm -hmm. out of um, such work. Thank you for the question. Um, and what I heard is that you have seen mastery, you have seen purpose in IT, autonomy. but, autonomy. sorry, uh, autonomy, but not as much purpose. So you've seen mastery and um, autonomy, but not as much purpose. How can we get 
purpose into uh, software houses and the likes of that. I would like some examples. Yeah. Not uh, it, maybe not uh, IT, IT or software mm. house if you do not have. No, uh, no, that, that's uh, that's fine. So. Um, Dal Arias. <laughs> so. Um, I am influenced by a man named Simon Sinek in this uh, aspect. He was the one who wrote the book called Start With Why. A lot of organizations, they know what they're doing, they know how they're doing it, but they are not always clear about why. And why and purpose is very, very close. So my answer to the question, I'm not going to give you an example, but I'm going to ask in the organization, why are we here? What is the higher purpose of us being here? What is it that we really want to deliver to, uh, to our customers? Um, because if we don't know it, then we may not be the best uh, supplier for them. So is the purpose spread top down? It should be, right? It's some kind of vision Mm -hmm. uh, purpose is uh, interesting. We can talk about that for a long time. Yes, it can be spread top down, but I'm not sure that that is always the best case. I think also uh, what uh, we need to allow sometimes is for purpose to grow. Uh, and let me give you one, uh, one short story. I was working a couple of years ago uh, with a Swedish uh, uh, consultancy company. Uh, they were like a software house. Uh, the company's name was even Soft House. Um, and I was not a developer. We were a group of 12 consultants and we were offering support for organizations to become agile, uh, work according to Scrum and stuff like that. Um, and we discovered that we didn't really have a common vision or a common purpose. So we decided that we needed to get that. So what we did was we um, set a date for a workshop and all, of, all 12 of us, we got some homework to do. So the homework was like this. We were asked to write a short, uh, not article, but uh, like shorter when it's uh, like yeah, 50 sh short rows uh, in a newspaper, some notice of some sort, about two years ahead. Some potential customer to us two years ahead telling how we went about helping them. So all of us 12 had to go back home and think out the story about that. And then we got to the workshop. Uh, we were very curious about the stories of the other guys, of course. And uh, it turned out in our case that they were very, very, very similar. So without talking about it, we kind of had it in us. And I believe just talking about it, asking about it, maybe do an exercise like that can help you to find a, a start, like a, a, a seed for a, for a purpose. And then it can grow from there. So it doesn't have to come top down, if you ask me. Could do, but not necessarily. Please. Um, in the circle of theory you presented, um, there is like um, the interactions, how interactions can um, happen between the certain circles. Yes. But this is the kind of standardization and, uh, you know, um, bringing out the autonomy actually of human intera interaction between the circles. Um, does this amount of, uh, you know, standardized uh, things really work? Is it, you know, Kind of. Uh, yeah, um, so the question is that in the theory of the circles, yeah. there was circle um, relationship manifests, uh, standardizing how to work between different circles. Um, yes. And there is a risk that it becomes too standardized uh, and that we stop thinking. Um, but we also want to make clear that some of the things we, we, should, we should be aware of, we, we should have that in our spine so that we can use our brains for the important stuff to solve the big problems of product development. Um, and uh, we believe also that it's good to have uh, resolutions uh, in a crisis. We 
should know what to do. Like when, uh, when you go into an airplane, you have in the seat pocket in front of you, what do you have there? Emergency procedures. So, and it's boring to listen to the people telling you about it, but it's pretty good to have it anyway. Um, and um, so, so the thing is to have the balance also. One thing is not going to make it. Only self-organization is not going to make it, but it's a big part of it. Only the relationship uh, manifests is not going to make it, but it's part of it. Uh, if I have to choose, I choose self-organization only, yes. Please. What does the Chinese symbol stand for? Uh, this stands for uh, Gemba. Uh, I think it's actually Japanese symbols. And Gemba, what is that in um, Japane Japanese language, lean? That's the place where you create the value. Thanks for asking. Okay. Um, I don't see any hands up in the air. So I take it that uh, you want to get rid of me right now. So thank you very much for uh, paying attention.